So we're looking at part 10 here on our wild harvest edibles. Uh, the topic is that prepares a table before me. That comes from Psalm 23. And in that case, it's that prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. So it's quite a significant uh, passage in, in Psalm out of Psalm 23. <clears throat> and uh, just a reminder of our, of our um, kind of important note that if, uh, when we talk about uh, potential therapeutic interventions that the plants that you eat can have in your life, that uh, um, <clears throat> you uh, do your due diligence in doing the research to find out um, how to apply that yourself, because we're introducing topics here and may not be exhaustive in our information. It's educational uh, primarily <clears throat> and can be just another tool in your wellness toolbox. And that when you're uh, working on a, a health um, situation that you enlist someone to assist you, your physician, your care team that has a similar philosophy of care that you do so that you can work together in harmony. <clears throat> so tonight we're gonna look at uh, something to start with that uh, many people uh, consider cottonwood uh, to be a, a tree that doesn't have much value. It's not very good at all for firewood because it tends to hold moisture for a very, very, very long time. It's not, um, it has copious amounts of, of cottonwood fluff, which we're seeing about this time of year. So it's kind of a messy tree in that regard. Um, but it turns out that there are also uh, edibility as well as therapeutic benefits to uh, the cottonwood tree. <clears throat> so there's something known as the balm of Gilead and it's made from cottonwood buds. There's also a Gilead tree that uh, is from derived in the same kind of fashion, but has a very amazing aroma to it. And just, uh, I just discovered this connection this spring. There's a place where I run up on the mountain behind our house and I run by and I am just positive in the past that there's gotta be bees somewhere close by because it smells just like propolis, which is essentially bee glue. It's the, <clears throat> the, the substance that bees make to seal holes and, and uh, um, make the hive stick together well inside. And it smells just like that. Well, it turns out that that resin is a component of the buds of cottonwood. And so what I was smelling was a cottonwood tree in its bud form and the resins from that tree being aromatized. Uh, the aroma was uh, coming out and exuding into the air around. So I would smell it every time I would run by that particular location. And I checked the other day and yes, there's a, a big cottonwood tree there. So it was kind of a revelation to me uh, on that. Uh, and we'll look about this a little bit further on, but we've uh, had an opportunity, uh, some friends of ours have harvested those buds and made some uh, extracts of them by putting the buds in, in olive oil and extracting those resins. And they have therapeutic properties that we'll look at later on. <clears throat> but the cottonwood is a member of the willow family and all the, the willow family are edible as well as have medicinal qualities. And in fact, the willow family is the, the family, the willow tree in particular, is the tree family from which aspirin was originally isolated because it has um, properties, the pain killing properties associated with it. From an edibility standpoint, the cottonwood leaves are edible. They're quite bitter tasting on their own, but they can be used uh, if you boil them and then discard the water. That takes away some of the bitterness. And then you can eat them green as part of a green salad. So one of the interesting things is that they're very high in protein and other nutrients. They actually have a higher amino acid content than rice, wheat, and barley. And we think of wheat in particular and rice as being staples across the world for uh, many cultures, barley also. But it's just interesting to note that that's, that tree has such... Uh, uh, good protein components to it. You can use it in soups or as a green in salads. The inner bark um, actually is quite stringy, uh, but it's uh, the inner bark, if you were to um, scrape it off, harvest it in the spring, it's going to have a higher uh, carbohydrate content in the spring because the sap is rising. Just dry it and powder it uh, for a soup thickener. So many times the things that, that uh, are used that are found in nature have a, for what we would think is a fairly labor intensive process to prepare it, considering the, the bark preparation. 
But if you think about the people who would have used them from an indigenous perspective, that's what they had to do. They weren't running off hither and yon. They were pretty much um, focused on preparing and acquiring enough food to uh, take them through the cold times and sustain them through the warm times. <clears throat> so they weren't, they weren't diverted and amused by lots of different things that, that we have in front of us today. So in the lower right, you have two different, uh, three different uh, varieties of the cottonwood. There's an eastern cottonwood and the western cottonwood. The one that we have uh, out our direction is the, the uh, trichocarpa um, <clears throat> species. And uh, there's also an eastern cottonwood variety. But typically, they'll stick up like this one that we see in the picture here. They're very tall and, and proud, stately. The leaves often and the buds aren't readily accessible except in young ones until you get a windstorm. So many times, their foliage is actually quite high and inaccessible in that regard. Uh, but there are times where it is, it is lower to the ground. <clears throat> So that's uh, some of the edibility components of the cottonwood. The leaves are edible as well as the, the inner bark. The buds and the catkins. So the catkins of the, of the cottonwood tree are coming out here. You can see them kind of progressing out of the bud and they're high in vitamin C. Now you would be getting them in the spring and typically the springtime is when vitamin C deficiencies begin to manifest themselves because there hasn't been much fresh um, produce or greens that are consumable during the winter time, especially in northern latitudes. But you can get that from a variety of sources, even from the buds forming on, on pine trees, uh, although they taste a little like pine salt. Uh, but there are other, other places that you can get a vitamin C, and that's an important thing for immune system function, as well as maintaining the um, integument area or skin system and the connective tissue um, requirements being maintained. So you can eat them like an alder catkin. Remember we spoke a couple weeks ago about the alder tree. You can eat those catkins, has a rather nutty-like flavor to it, and you can saute them, steam them, or add them to, to soups as a, a texture and a dimension um, addition. So you can see that there's uh, up over here, you see the bud <clears throat> sticking up here off the side that would have uh, resins in it. Uh, these are going to have resins in them as well that uh, could then become useful uh, for extracting those resins for therapeutic purposes. But the catkins here are, are edible in their, in their own right. So again, the cottonwood leaves, you can see the cottonwood leaves up here. Those would be used in an edible way for uh, like boiling and then, and then <clears throat> taking the water off of them and uh, using them that would extract some of the bitterness from them. So the buds and the bark themselves have a high salicylic acid in them. So they're very helpful in pain relief and fever reduction. And the, the resins that are present in the bud, in fact, if you were to go and pick those buds, you would find that your fingers would be quite sticky from removing them. In fact, this last weekend, we were out hiking as a family and found a downed limb. The leaves are already on, but this was a downed limb during a storm, evidently, back when the tree was budding. So we actually collected some of the buds from that. They still had the resin there, still had the smell. So we'll uh, attempt doing some extraction from the, that, that handful of, of buds that we were able to collect on our hike. It makes uh, walking, hiking, looking at your own yard and its landscape much more interesting when you know that you can eat it um, or use it for, for medicine if needed. So the bud resin is used in oils uh, that can you be used topically in salves. Be helpful for sore muscles, uh, joints, tendons, for all different types of pain and inflammation. They can, it can be rubbed on the skin and absorbed in. And because it has that uh, analgesic effect, it uh, is a painkiller or a reducer. So some areas using uh, you know, joint pain and arthritis and sore muscles use the cottonwood bud oil helps joint inflammation to be reduced, beneficial for carpal tunnel, arthritis, so itis is inflammation, arthro is joint, so it's just joint pain, uh, and muscles. And you can use it three times a day, just to massage that into the area of pain. Um, you can also use a, a crushed leaf poultice. So if you don't have the resins, because they're only collectible in the spring when the buds are just emerging, you can also get some therapeutic benefit just from the uh, a poultice of the crushed leaves itself. So arthritis and joint issues. 
You can also use a, a cottonwood bark decoction. So a good decoction, again, is an extraction that takes more time than just an infusion. It's a, a longer um, boil time to extract the therapeutic elements as a, compared to a tea. So they can be used to aid in, in menstrual cramping. So how do you get that get cottonwood bud oil and make it into a salve? So here's a recipe for it. Um, you take one cup of cottonwood buds to three cups of a carrier oil. So that carrier oil can be um, a number of different things. It can be olive oil. It can be coconut oil. Uh, the beeswax actually be used later on um, down uh, further in the recipe, but you want to have some of that handy as well. So olive oil or coconut oil. Uh, the coconut oil is going to be probably more uh, shelf stable. Uh, that can be used. It also has the, the component that it'll solidify and may not need to be incorporated with the beeswax in the same way if you're using as if you're using olive oil. The olive oil and the beeswax mixture helps to make a, a uh, more conducive salve. So infuse the oil with the buds. Basically, you place the oil in a double boiler on low heat uh, and then uh, add the buds and allow the and allow the infusion to take place. So the oil will change color. So you can do this a cold infusion or a warm infusion. This is kind of giving a kickstart with a warm infusion. You can do the whole thing cold and not have the heat taking place, um, but it, it helps to kind of jumpstart the infusion process. So the resin will stick to the jar or pot that's used. So it's pretty much a dedicated pot once you've used it for that. Uh, and alcohol uh, use, uh, rubbing alcohol can uh, remove that resin, but it's a, a pretty tedious process. <clears throat> So begin with the heat uh, and then cold infuse for an additional six to eight weeks. Uh, you can also leave that infusion just a strictly cold infusion for eight to 10 weeks or more. And the more longer it's left, the more uh, resin will be extracted uh, and make a stronger uh, extraction. You can also speed up the whole process if you've run out and need more and you can do it just simply using low heat for a number of days. So you can do a, a warm extraction or a heated extraction, a mixture extraction, or a completely cold extraction. So once you've come to the end of your time, then uh, strain the buds and then heat up the oil. So you're gonna have the, the buds strained out, the, the resins and the, the oil that's left behind. Uh, warm that up and add the, the beeswax at a ratio of four to one. So four oil to one, one part beeswax. Then you can see this uh, salve jar here, this picture here on the right has, uh, it'll look a little bit like that and it will be easy to, to rub on. Beeswax, you can use just beeswax straight, but it's quite hard um, and it takes the body heat to, to melt it down. It's harder than uh, even coconut oil, but very similar hardness to it when it's, when it's um, solid. But uh, then put that in a glass jar and cool it and use it as, as needed. It'll keep pretty much indefinitely. So we have some around the house that we use periodically if we have um, some kind of skin irritation or pain, <clears throat> muscle pain or something like that. So the jar on the left there is, is a jar of the buds being infused into some olive oil. So if you have injured skin, it's beneficial in the fact that it's antibacterial and antimicrobial, antifungal. So it's gonna help prevent uh, entrance by pathogens into the skin, which could cause a secondary infection associated with that. Also has uh, very high antioxidant qualities associated with it. So it's very good in uh, salves for various types of skin injuries, everything from rashes and chap lips to other types of irritations. Um, sores, uh, boils, and it just aids healing as well as preventing infection along the way. You can also wash the skin with a cottonwood decoction. And we'll look at that recipe over here on the, on the right here in just a second. But the, the cottonwood buds um, aid in cell regeneration. So that's one reason why they're so beneficial for skin uh, healing. You can use them along with calendula oil for a face and neck cream essentially has anti-aging properties associated with it, which basically uh, means that it accelerates the, the healing of the skin, maintains tone and um, uh, resiliency of the skin. So it can help to eliminate or reduce uh, wrinkling associated with aging. So in that regard, it just uh, helps your skin be healthy. So a decoction that you would make, this is using leaf bed, buds or bark. So bark could be done any time of the year. The leaf buds, again, would be restricted to uh, the springtime or whenever you would have been able to collect those buds. 
um, in two cups of water. So three quarters of an ounce of cottonwood leaf buds in two cups of water. Bring that uh, um, to boil, should be boil, not oil. So B-O-I-L and simmer that for 10 to 15 minutes. Strain it and cool it. And then you can use a, a compress with the, the cool decoction, which is essentially, a, a, it's like a tea. It's only been uh, boiled longer. So typically you would take a, in an infusion, just a simple infusion, you just pour hot water over it and let it cool, steep for um, several minutes before consuming it. But this is gonna take a longer time to simmer and then, uh, and then cool. So use a, a compress uh, washed or wrung out of the, of the decoction fluid, then you can place it on the infected skin or affected skin. So you can use it for 20 minutes or use it as needed. You can also use it as a wash and it helps to fight pain and inflammation. Again, because it has those analgesic effects uh, from the salicylic acid that's commonly present in the willow family of, of trees. It's also beneficial for a respiratory issue like pneumonia and flu. You can use an infusion, so that's a tea that would be made from the leaves or the buds, um, or a tincture. So tincture is a, a longer term extraction process. Um, it's beneficial for whooping cough and tuberculosis, colds, flu, and pneumonia. So essentially it helps uh, you, uh, upper URIs, upper respiratory uh, tract infections. Essentially it kills and inhibits the influenza virus and bacteria. And it's best if it's used early in the process of, of the illness. So as soon as you feel something coming on, this is when you use it. Uh, later on, if you just kind of let it go and come into a more exacerbated position, uh, you'd have to use um, some different strategies. But this is a good early onset uh, relief mechanism. So it helps deaden or lessen any pain, helps to reduce fever associated with, with influenza, um, as well as aiding the removal of excess mucus and phlegm that builds up as the body attempts to move that bacteria out of the body. Sometimes it can get pretty thick and become obstructive, um, but this helps to thin it a little bit and allow, allows the body to expel it more easily. It's also helpful for um, in sore throat. So cottonwood bark infusion. So again, this is the inner bark. So steep that and gargle it. It's good for mouth sores and, and sore throats. And then uh, the gastrointestinal tract. Sometimes we have worms and there's different ways to do worming, but this is one way to do it. Cottonwood bark decoction helps to eliminate intestinal worms. And that's a good thing, just uh, probably a good thing to do routinely, um, not constantly, but uh, periodically. And harvesting those buds again uh, is early spring or late winter as they're forming. Windfall is often typically the best way to access them because oftentimes they're very high in the trees. If you have a cottonwood tree that is at your disposal that you can prune to keep it at a place where you can actually use it, that would be probably beneficial. Otherwise, you're relying on windfall for accessing the buds. So it'd be helpful to use an oiled or a gloved hand to help keep them resin free. Uh, so you want to leave the end or the terminal bud on the branch if it's attached to a living branch. That way it can continue and um, add new growth. Otherwise, you, you've just stripped off all the, all the leaves from it for that, that season. <clears throat> and then rubbing alcohol can remove the, the resins in particular, because uh, those can be quite, quite sticky. So the next plant that we'll look at is a very common one here, particularly in the coastal areas. It's called Salau, uh, Galatheria shellon. It's in the Heath family. And it can grow to be four feet tall. So it makes a nice hedge. The bears are sweetest in the fall following the first frost, but can be eaten all summer long as soon as they turn dark. Uh, they can be tart and they can be mild. So if you don't like the taste in one particular bush or stand, you may find that it tastes better in a different stand. So from bush to bush, region to region, they can have different tastes to them. You'll notice how the picture here has the ripe ones back in closer to the foliage and the less ripe ones out at the end. It's because the buds come on progressively. The blossoms you see down below uh, kind of continue to kind of pop out that, uh, that stem. And so they all get uh, pollinated and begin setting fruit closer into the bush as compared to further out. So it'll be rather unusual early in the summer to find a whole stem that's gonna be completely ripe altogether. They'll have a progression of them, but later in the summer, they'll have whole stems. It'll be easy to just kind of pull a whole handful off at once. 
and they're really good. They're kind of uh, like a fuzzy blueberry. Uh, they have a little bit of hair on them, but they're they're tasty. I've enjoyed eating them. They're a little more mealy than than a blueberry, but very tasty. Uh, they can be eaten fresh or cooked. Uh, sometimes lemon juice added to them can kind of bring out the flavor, brighten it up a bit. The dried berries were a very common uh, staple that was used through the winter. They would be dried and mixed with other nuts and seeds and berries, kind of making an energy bar by the Native Americans. So it was a very highly prized uh, nutrient resource for Native Americans during, um, during their preparation for winter uh, food sources. You can also crush the berries into kind of a paste you can spread them on top of skunk cabbage leaves because that's kind of a nice, broad, clean surface and let it dry and or just use wax paper, whatever you happen to have at hand uh, and let it dry out um, and make a sort of a fruit leather. Now you might notice and recognize the leaves of this plant because it's often harvested and used as the greenery and floral arrangements. And in fact, in some places, there has been some poaching of this occurring in national parks. Typically the collection of it for sale is permitted by the Forest Service and different agencies uh, for a collection to take place in the wild, uh, but it is a uh, actually a very useful uh, foliage for floral arrangement arrangements. Medicinally speaking, the berries and leaves are, are both used medicinally. The leaves have astringent qualities, uh, which basically means that they compress or cause contraction of tissue, which is helpful for wounds and things like that. It has some benefits for the immune system uh, for all types of infections, it has lots of good anti-inflammatory properties, which are enhanced or provided by the antioxidants, vitamins, and tannic acid that's present in those leaves. Basically to help accelerates healing and enhances the immune function uh, for helping to prevent uh, disease. So in the skin, it's helpful for various types of skin issues, uh, the powdered leaf, powdered leaf poultice. So you can take those leaves, you can dry them and powder them, have them on hand for any time of the year, any place. So when you're in a place where you could collect some, you could just collect them, bring them home and dry them. Leave that in place for uh, 20 minutes or more. So that should be a, a minute. Uh, the powder leaf poultice on skin burns, wounds, or abrasions, uh, or you can wash the skin with a crushed leaf infusion. So take the leaves, crush them. They're a fairly waxy leaf and very fairly tough. They're not pliable. Like, in fact, they're actually, you can use them year round because they don't fall off. They're actually an evergreen in the, in the sense that like rhododendron, um, they keep their greenery all year round. So that's a benefit of the leaves being used from a medicinal standpoint is you can access them any time of the year. So just crush them and then make a tea out of them and allow that tea after the wash, just wash the skin with it and let it dry on the skin. So because it has those astringent qualities, uh, it helps draw the tissue together and it helps accelerate uh, wound healing. For chronic skin issues, a handful of berries a day is very beneficial. It helps to increase blood circulation to the skin surface. So salal is, is one of my favorite, favorite um, wild foods. Um, and I just uh, am learning about the medicinal benefits of them too. But we have to remember that, you know, like Hippocrates said way back in the day, that uh, we need to let our, our uh, food be our medicine and our medicine actually be our food. And it can take care of a lot of issues that uh, um, have cropped up in our lives at various times. Beneficial for uh, gas pain, colic, and diarrhea. So the, the leaf of the uh, Salal leaf tea, it's very safe for children. Give it two to three hours uh, post eating if there's stomach pains, so it could be gaseous or, or other types of colicky issues. Diarrhea, um, use the tea often until the symptoms are resolved. Uh, for respiratory issues, uh, use again salal leaf tea. It's good for tuberculosis and colic, as well as uh, dry coughs that can be persistent. Uh, so that's a nice thing to have on hand. So again, salal leaf tea. And again, those leaves are green year round. You can just go get them, crush them and, and make, a, make an infusion. Um, the dry leaf could probably be used too, uh, although we saw that indicated primarily as, the, as a poultice. So heartburn, you can chew the leaves or use again, the leaf tea for heartburn. Um, and then obesity and appetite, it actually has an appetite suppressing quality to, uh, to it. The young leaves, if they're chewed, so the young leaves would be the ones in the spring that are coming out on the, on the ends of the, of the foliage uh, can aid in weight loss and appetite uh, suppressant as a, as a component of that. So it could be helpful in a time of starvation too, actually, <clears throat> uh, to kind of abate, abate hunger. 
actually very beneficial in UTI and, and bladder and urinary tract infection um, issues because it helps reduce inflammation. Again, the salal leaf tea used several times a day can help to resolve um, those types of, of issues associated with that. And then uh, looking at various insect stings. So wherever you are, you may end up with a, a bite or a sting or, or some kind of an insect intrusion on your, on your um, sanity. Uh, so powdered leaf paste, again, applied directly. So here's powdered leaf again, um, and it can be used effectively in the absence of plantain. So plantain is, is, has been my go-to uh, for bee stings and things like that. But if you are in a place, and typically plantain does not grow where salal is. So they're kind of mutually exclusive in their, in their growing areas just because of the type of habitat they have. But you will have or likely one or the other, particularly here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, you can see a, a kind of a variety of the different leaves that are dried there um, and a, a cup of tea there. And actually you can make jam. This is actually a chia gel jam with the salal leaves that's been made here. That'd uh, be pretty, pretty tasty. So again, it has anti-aging effects uh, because of the, the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant uh, components that are part of it. So the salal leaf tea recipe use five to six dry leaves and or a tablespoon of the crushed leaves. Add a cup of boiling water over that and uh, let, the, let those leaves steep for about 20 minutes and then strain and drink as, as needed. So that's salau. And we looked at the cottonwood. So cottonwood is a tree, salau is a shrub. Uh, cottonwood is going to be seasonally available because the leaves are deciduous and the buds are seasonal. The berries of salal are seasonal, but the, the leaves, and, which derive most of the medicinal qualities, actually are year-round, present year-round, and that's a very um, handy thing to have. So those are our two um, things that uh, God's provided for us in nature for both food and medicine for uh, our part 10.